vitamin D and weight. Vitamin D causes weight gain, stunts growth, increases risk of dementia and Parkinson's disease later in life. And there's a high prevalence of vitamin D. The majority of people in sun-rich areas of the country are still vitamin D deficient. Let me tell you what happened to me in my office last week. I had to throw the slide in there because it was so, such a, makes such a great point. This guy comes in to see me, and I was thrilled to see him. He got all better. He had come to see me a couple months earlier, and he had unrelenting, unrelenting vomiting for three years. He couldn't stop vomiting. Everything he ate, vomited back up again. The only thing he ate was a little oatmeal paste that he ground up in the Vitamix with a little bit of water, very thin down. It was like taking like, just like thin fluids into his body. He saw, he saw multiple gastroenterologists before he saw me. They did biopsies, they did you know, emptying studies, they did endoscopies, they did every test in the world in this guy. And they came to the conclusion, and, and three different doctors gave him three different advice. The first doctor recommended he have Botox injections to his, to his pyloric valve that, lay, that, that opens up and allows food out of the stomach to relax it. The other doctor recommended the implantation of an electronic surgical device to induce pyloric dumping, right? And the third doctor meant, recommended a drug which can cause permanent brain damage. You know, these, these ant, neuroleptic, ant, right? And then he comes to see me not satisfied with that advice. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but he's still vomiting all the time, right? Okay, so I take a look at this guy. He's eating a vegan diet, by the way. He looks pretty healthy, except he's really thin now. So what do you think I do for him? Take his blood test. Check him for everything. Something's going wrong here. We gotta figure out what's wrong with you. His vitamin D level comes back below five. So I put him on vitamin D, problem goes away in a month. He's all better. One month later, he's all gone. Comes back to see me last week and he says, you cured me. I'm back to normal again. This is vitamin D. I asked him, an intelligent guy like you, bright, educated, eating healthy, why don't you know about vitamin D? He said, I was told that you get enough from the sun, and I get some sun. The other thing we need to keep it real about is our addictions. So many of us have addictions. Some of us are pretty clear about our addictions and what they are. I'm going to stand up here today and bear myself because we are keeping it real, and I think the only way to get better is to just speak publicly. Hi, I'm Rory, and I'm a sugar addict. <laughs> It's true, and I'm not saying it to be cute or funny. Literally just two or three days ago, I was in the shower, and I read somewhere once that all your ideas or something, or the most time you remember things or have ideas is when you're in the shower. I don't remember where I read that, but it always happens to me. So I'm in the shower, and I'm scrubbing my head, and I'm looking down, and my stomach is like this. And I'm also ready to barf because I ate a piece of a vegan peanut butter chocolate chip brownie. And I didn't think I ate that much. I felt like I tried really hard to keep it under control and to not scarf the whole thing down. But I scarfed enough down in a fast enough time period with big enough bites and not breathing while I was doing it. Kind of manic, I'm like <gasps> because it was so good and I'm a sugar addict. So I stood there in the shower with my stomach out to there and feeling like I was gonna throw up on my stomach, thinking, I have a real problem. This is really bad, like I keep doing this to myself and I keep thinking it doesn't matter because I'm skinny and I'm such a healthy eater. But no, it's a serious problem. Sugar's not good for our body. And I'm not saying that we should live without sweets. You know, enjoying food is part of our life and I don't want to, I don't like, oh, I don't want to stop eating sweets forever. But I did decide and I did say to myself, I need to stop this. I need to take a break and walk away from sugar. So I just started two or three days ago um, a 30 day sugar fast and it sucks, I'm miserable. <laughs> yeah, it sucks, it sucks. Um, I'm not having fun, I hate it here. <laughs> I hate all of you. <laughs> um, I hate all my friends who still eat sugar, it's not fair that they get to do it and I can't. But I'm clear that if I'm being real with myself and I wanna be this healthy eater and I want my body to be healthy from the inside out and I wanna keep myself young and healthy for longevity purposes and not get cancer or any of these other disease, I need to take a little step back from sugar. So I decided that I'm not gonna eat sugar from whatever day that was until Thanksgiving. That's more than 30 days, just so we're clear. Uh -huh. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this today and exposing my vulnerability and telling you that the author of Skinny Bitch, the bestseller, um, on the New York Times list, I have an addiction and I'm addressing it. And I'm wondering today, for those of you sitting out there, what's your dirty little secret? What is it that you know you need to get rid of, that you've been fighting, resisting get, getting rid of? Um, oh! <laughs> Who said that? Where would I? Is that you? Oh, I love it.
love it. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> wow, she had to say that too. She just couldn't keep that in. And you know what? Sometimes when we change our diets, that's exactly what happens. We do get rid of shitty relationships or we do quit those jobs that we're not happy with or we do end um, friendships that just weren't serving us. So really, truly, when we change our diets, we open up this whole portal for an amazing and inspiring and motivating and amazing beautiful life that we deserve and that we should be living every single day. And believe me, I'm not standing up here and pretending that my life rocks every day. I'm just like everybody else on the planet who's mired in all my crap all the time. But I'd love to inspire you to do better. <laughs> you guys can be happy. I can't because I don't eat sugar. You are designed as a starch seeker. On the tip of your tongue are sweet tasting taste buds. They're not there by accident. They were put there for a reason. They are there so that you will seek out high concentrations of, of sugars. In, in this case, in the form of starch. Yeah, it could be some fruits too, or it could be some honey. But primarily, you're out there to seek starch. That's what the tip of the tongue says, is seek starch. Now, if you were a cat, you would have no sweet tasting taste buds on the tip of your tongue you would have amino tasting taste buds on the tip of your tongue. And you would be out there seeking amino acids, which make up proteins, because a cat is a meat eater. People are starch eaters. The tip of the tongue says so. The whole digestive process says so. The presence of amylase, which is solely to digest starch, is in the saliva and the rest of the upper intestinal tract. You are a starch eater by design. Now, starches, they have, uh, now what I'm, what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about potatoes and rice and corn and so on. Starches have lots of protein. In fact, enough protein to meet anybody's needs. They have lots of vitamin and minerals. In fact, there's some starches like potatoes and sweet potatoes that have all the vitamin and minerals, all the proteins, all the essential fats, everything you would possibly need to survive on except for a little B12. And if you don't clean your starches very well, you'll get that too. The other is plant foods, and these are the tropical oils like coconut palm, palm kernel, and cocoa butter, which is the fat that comes out of the cocoa bean. So now these have become real popular lately, and in fact have become health foods. And uh, you should avoid these. These are saturated fats. I understand there's different types, so we'll get into that, but you want to avoid these. Just because they're a plant and because they grow in the ground doesn't mean they're good for you. This is one of the arguments. There are berries and mushrooms you could eat that you'll die from. So, some of these are worse for you than butter. So, saturated fats, solid, very stable, mostly animals, tropical oils. There is no essential need for saturated fat. What that means is you can make all that your body requires. And so, if you were to need it, you can make it. Okay, now we got polys. These are liquid at room temperature, like corn oil. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's getting a little dry. <laughs> It's water. I know, I know you've, you've been in hearing a lot about the health advantages, and they're very considerable uh, of, of a, a plant-based diet. And I could speak about that too. But I want to focus in this hour a little differently. I want to focus on a larger picture, and I want to start with our relationship to the animals involved. Um, I don't think compassion is a weakness. I don't think that, that to feel with empathy with other beings, other people, people of different, a different gender than you are, people of different race, people of different ethnicity, different economic class, different backgrounds. I don't think empathy is a weakness. I think it's a, a requirement of, a, of the human fulfillment. And it's an imperative if we're gonna get along with each other and create a world that works for all of us. A thriving and just and sustainable way of life. So I think the development of compassion and the recognition of our compassion and the honoring of our compassion in the way that we live is a requirement. If we're to evolve, if we're to be successful as a species, if we're to persevere. 
I, I think that the word success has been ex expropriated. And when we say someone is a success, don't we usually mean they've made a lot of money or have a lot of money? Isn't that the typical meaning? But, but that's, to my eyes, an impoverishing definition of what a human successful life is. That's very limited. How do they make their money? What are they doing with their money? Uh, and are they living with recognition of the, of the fact that we all draw breath from the same source? And when we forget that, we lose something of our humanity, we lose something of our connectivity, and we, we lose some of our empowerment as people. And I, I think that um, connecting to animals is a power, it's a strength. I mean, how many of you have known an animal in your life um, that, and that that relationship has given you something significant? Significant. I must see some hands, thank you. That's a lot, thank you. I think that our relationships with other beings can enrich us as human beings. But then when you see how livestock are, are raised, how, how they're, they're kept in the factory farms, it's just such a, an abomination. Basically, micronutrients were discovered in 1930. 14 vitamins, 16 minerals discovered in 1930. People said, wow, this is fantastic. We could help people live a longer, healthier, more, um, you know, a better life, have less cancer, less autoimmune diseases, less allergies, make sure people are having nutritional adequacy. And people started, and we did things to help people. We added thiamine and riboflavin into cocoa puffs. <laughs> and vitamin C into Kool-Aid. And what happened was, surprising to everybody, is from 1935 to 2005, through that 70 years stretch, cancer rates went up every single year for 70 years in a row. In unbelievable, isn't that? That cancer could increase every single year for 70 years straight. Not one year did it level off or go down. And we thought, you know, um, you know autoimmune diseases skyrocketed, cancer, um, heart disease continued to climb, autism um, went like crazy. So obviously, taking vitamin and mineral supplements were not the answer, and it wasn't until about 15 years ago when scientists finally recognized that the major micronutrient load that was in food was not vitamins or minerals, it was phytochemicals. So just to clarify that, what I'm saying is that, the, that there are more accessory nutrients that are not vitamins and minerals in natural foods, and there are vitamins and minerals by amount, by quantity, by, by weight, and, and by function in the human body, because the body has a huge need for various substances that are in natural foods, but you actually have to eat real foods to get these things, because they're lost in processing. And they're also not really in animal products that much. So the first thing I'm saying is that animal products don't contain any of the antioxidant vitamins and minerals. They don't contain vitamin E, vitamin C, vitamin K, folate, bioflavonoids, lignans, the carotenoid family that are so important, like lutein and lycopene and beta carotene and alpha carotene and all those um, they're not in animal products either. They're only in vegetation. And neither are those lignans or, or phytochemicals we're talking about that are so important, or the isothiocyanides. And you know what? They're not in processed foods either. So the first thing I'm saying here today is that a piece of chicken is just like a bagel. Why are the piece of chicken and the bagel the same? Why am I saying that? Right, right, because their micronutrient load is so low that they're essentially, their sources of macronutrients, the chicken gives us protein, the bagel gives us carbohydrate, but they're macronutrients without a micronutrient load. So they're both contributing overall to the overall micronutrient, low micronutrient level in the American diet. Uh, well, first I'd like to thank you for a fascinating lecture, and I intend to work on putting your ideas into practice. Um, I did have one question on uh, your concept of forgiveness and giving up our resentments. I agree that that's extremely important and it's something we should ver work on trying to do very often. But also, we are moral agents, and are there not situations that do call for righteous anger? Okay. Um, uh, forgiveness does not mean that we condone the bad behavior of others. It doesn't mean that we uh, relinquish uh, the need for consequences. People do things that are wrong, then they need to take responsibility for it. You know, there need to be consequences. Uh, we don't condone bad behavior. We can forgive without condoning bad behavior. We can forgive at the same time that we, you know, feel that the punishment is necessary. Um, the, the, the idea of righteous anger, um, 
is, is ultimately a mistake. Uh, it, you know, it, it certainly, it, it, we, if, we ha- if we experience the anger because somebody has done something that's really wrong, you know, we recognize that, but we let go of the anger as soon as possible. Anger in general really, really hurts us. Um, you know, the, uh, hang on a second. The uh, anger is, a, is, a, is, is basically a terrible emotion. It's a signal device. But basically, you know, the anger is like a device where uh, somebody attacks you or, or assaults you or threatens you. And the anger is, is an emotion designed to like tell you to do something. I'm in danger. I better do something, fight or flight. So the anger is important in signaling that something has, has happened and that's threatening. And for survival purposes, you better do something about it. But once you make the decision to do something about it, then the anger no longer has any value. And if you hang on to it, whether you think it's righteous or not, you're just wasting your time. And more than that, you're hurting yourself because anger is a terrible emotion. I mean, just look at the type A personality types. These people who are, it's not simply that they're workaholics. They have a huge amount of aggression and anger and, uh, and they have more heart attacks and more premature deaths. Uh, anger hurts us. Anger like, you know, raises your blood pressure, your heart rate, you have more strokes, you have more heart attacks, it suppresses the immune system, you get sicker, it's harder to uh, recover from illness. So anger is really bad news. Once it's served its signal device purpose, you want to let go of it. And you can still, f- again, you can still feel that, uh, you know, that this person uh, needs to be punished. This person needs to acknowledge and recognize the consequences of bad behavior. But we want to get away from judging people in general, no matter what they've done. It's, you know, and we want to get off of our spot as quickly as possible. Whenever I, we have a negative emotion or any, anything, even like uh, even anxiety or pain or any negative emotion, we, they're all signal devices to tell us to do something. But once we do it, once we recognize the value of it, then we let it go. We tell ourselves, I don't need any more. Thanks for tipping me off that there's something wrong, but now I don't need any more. So we want to get rid of anger. We don't need it. Anger hurts us. Forgiveness heals us. But again, it doesn't mean that we're a doormat. It doesn't mean that we're telling people they can walk all over us. It doesn't mean that we, we are condoning their behaviors. You know, it's, it's just in our best interests to let go of anger and judgment and attack thoughts. Because like I said, when you do that, you're actually freeing yourself of your own self-contempt and, and uh, guilt and shame. The fat vegan, the fat, this seems like an oxymoron, doesn't it? But, you know, contradictory terms, how could the two ever be put together, a fat vegan? But it's so common that we do see fat vegans. And it's of great concern to me because <clears throat> vegan says a lot about people. It says that they're really interested in their food and they're willing and able to make profound changes. They've done it in many cases because of animal rights, an extremely important issue. In other cases, people have uh, become vegans because they're concerned about the environment, they're concerned about planet Earth. Great reasons to change your diet. And it says a lot about these people because they have, people, vegans, have made powerful changes. Uh, They have uh, changed their diet in face of the fact that everybody has told them they'll become protein deficient and calcium deficient. And even with those universally accepted fears, they've still changed their diet. That says a lot about a person, doesn't it? And care for their causes. And they're willing to stand up to everybody, to mother, to daughter, to doctor, to dietitian. They're willing to stand up to all of these people and say, I don't care about your well-meaning advice. It's so important to me that I do the right thing that I'm going to make these changes. These are people of character, vegans are. Having enough satisfies the mind and frees the heart to find what matters. Less stuff is more spirit. Okay, now, Notice what I've interpolated here. Less is more is a common watchword. We hear that, we read that. Many people say, oh yeah, that's not my experience. I can't hear that. Don't tell me that. What does that mean? Don't you feel deprived? Don't you feel needy? Well, it's not that less is more is not a philosophical proposal. It's not a proposition. It's to say, 
when you have less stuff, there's more room for living. It frees up your six senses to experience, which satisfies the heart. You know, people always say, I would love to eat the way you do, but、um, I live in some town and all we have is a grocery store. We don't have any of these fancy stores. I'm like, that's okay. Yeah, Everything I'm asking you to buy is in the local grocery store. So hey, go Jeff, ahead. What what dish is this you're making right now? Pasta primavera. We're making the sauce. <laughs> <right now. laughs> All right, we're gonna do some leafy greens. So we'll do some peas. Now this one is a pound, so we're only gonna use part of it. So we、we'll、use, you know, it's no direct measure. How's that? That looks good. Maybe、like、corn. And then we always put、um, green leafies in. What'd you girls buy me today? Today we bought fresh spinach. <laughs> Fresh frozen spinach. So we'll put a little bit of that, and this is a pound bag. I always put a lot. In. Oh, you always do a lot.、Like、half the bag. Half the bag. Yeah. Okay. But this is it. Now all we do is we let this sit. In about five minutes, it'll be done. We'll put the spice in. One of the ones we like is、uh, garlic. garlic. So I want you to see, the number one killer of Americans is what? Heart heart disease. <laughs> and I want you to watch. This is basically in time-lapse photography. What happens to the average artery over the span of 20, 30, 40 years? Watch this. Right, and so it's basically all that that wonderful endothelium has shriveled up, and it's basically rotted out. And now we have all kinds of calcification and scar、uh, calcification, uh, scar tissue,、uh, and fatty deposits and cholesterol. But this doesn't have to be. And if you eat a plant-based diet, you can keep those arteries nice and red and rosy and healthy until the day you die. Does everybody know what this is? Exactly. Right. And I believe Breast Cancer Awareness Month is going on right now. I don't know about you guys, but everywhere I turn, I'm seeing, you know, this, and I'm saying, walk for the cure, run for the cure, shop for the cure. Fly for the cure, and I am. I'm just like, hey, where is eat for the cure? And more than that, eating plant-based is the cure.